Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh and a very good morning and salam ramadan to all viewers welcome to our sixth session of webinar series captain of industry brought to you by faculty of engineering we are initiating university industry collaboration during mco to have a platform with our captain of industry to share their thoughts way forward and challenges during post covid 19 now we are streaming live from fb faculty of engineering today Gladly, we would like to welcome Dr. Zaharuddin Mansour, National Technology Officer, Microsoft Malaysia, with his topic today entitled COVID-19 Accelerating. Without further ado, I would like to invite Yang Berusaha Professor Dato' Engineer Dr. Muhammad Rafiq Haji Dato' Abdul Qadir, Dean Faculty of Engineering, to introduce our captain today. Over to you, Dato'. Thank you, Murni. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning uh, to our speaker Dr. Zaharuddin and also a very good morning to all of you watching this Captain of Industry webinar live through our Faculty of Engineering Facebook. First of all, I would like to say thank you so much to our presenter today. Despite his busy schedule, can still slot an hour with us to share his experience as the National Technology Office at Microsoft and be appointed as our Captain of Industry. Let me brief all of you a short biography of our speaker. Dr. Zaha received a first-class honours degree in computer systems engineering from Monash University, Australia in 1985 and completed his PhD in computer science in 1988, means three years later. Dr. Zaha joined Microsoft in 2005 and has more than 33 years of professional experience in ICT and telecommunications in senior leadership engineering, research, as well as academic roles. In 2010, he had the honor of leading the Business Services Economic Transformation Program, ETP Labs, and in 2018, appointed a committee member of the National Education Policy Review Council. He also presently is an adjunct professor at International Islamic University, Malaysia, IIUM, and member of industrial advisory panels at several other universities, where he works closely with academia and has publications as well as professional certifications and recognition in data science, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, software engineering, computer architectures, telecommunications, and digital transformation. He also holds several associate positions at PICOM, MQA, Department of Standards, CIRIM, and others. Dr. Zaha is passionate about technology and aspires to contribute towards the national, the nation, the nation's digital economy initiative, and has contributed in a number of national strategic publications in the areas of data science, cybersecurity, technology foresight, computing, telecommunications, economic transformation, and education. So, without further ado, I call upon Dr. Zaharuddin Mansur. Over to you, Doctor. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, Puan, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good morning to all. First of all, thank you very much to UTM for inviting me to this uh, session today. It is indeed an honour and a pleasure. Now, prior to COVID-19, I used to say that data and artificial intelligence was really accelerating the pace of the fourth industrial revolution and it's the disruptions that we see. But now I say that COVID-19, what it has done is brought forward and forced upon us uh, a new normal far ahead of time. So today I'm happy to share with you my thoughts on the need for us to urgently accelerate our digital transformation to enable us to deal with the unknown and volatile post-COVID era. But before I do that, I think I'd like to level set our understanding. Because if I ask all of you, what is fourth industrial revolution? What is digital transformation? I would probably get a few different answers, right? So for me, when we talk about industrial revolution, it is kind of a significant turning point from a social economic standpoint in history. So if you think about ourselves maybe 10, 15 years ago, right? If you were to use our phone in a conference, for example, sitting in France, it would con be considered to be kind of, you know, unethical. But in today's world, you, you find that everyone uses a phone, whether they're on stage or off stage, right? So really, 
things have changed a lot from a social standpoint. But I think many don't realize the economic standpoint that you know things have changed. So I would like to draw your attention to this Digital Economy Report 2019 from the United Nations, which published, I think, end of last year, where one of the uh, you know one of the charts it shows the you know a bubble chart for various companies around the world, right? So a couple of things, and the size of the chart is really their market capitalization. You see Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet is Google, and so on and so forth, right? And you can see that in the U.S., and the big ones are actually in U.S. and Asia, interestingly. yeah. Um, unfortunately, there's none from Malaysia. There's one from Indonesia, right? So we have still a lot to do, yeah? But a couple of things which brought to my attention, I think the first thing is that if you look at this chart, uh, only a handful of companies that existed before 1995, namely maybe Microsoft, perhaps uh, Samsung here, and Apple, definitely, right? So these are probably the three or four companies that existed before 1995. The rest are all new companies, right? And all and many of these companies are unknown companies. I'm not sure whether you've heard about NTF. That's one of the most successful fintech company in the world today, for example, right? and we've not even heard about it. So these companies came from nowhere, becoming very successful companies in a very short period of time, disrupting global businesses, right? Like how you see Uber and Grab disrupting the transportation industry and how Netflix is disrupting the broadcasting industry and so on. Another very interesting observation from this chart is it's cross industry. When you talk about the fourth industrial revolution, it's not only about manufacturing. It is, for example, obviously Microsoft, Apple, Samsung, we are technology companies. Amazon and Alibaba, they are kind of retail or B2B companies, really, right? Facebook and Google, they are advertising companies. And NTF is a fintech company. So you see that, you know, it cuts across all kinds of industry. And really, when we talk about in this new world, we do not know who our competitors are. 15 years ago, I wouldn't have dreamt that the, one of the main competitors for Microsoft is actually Amazon, which is a retail company, and Google, which is an advertising company, right? So that's the irony of it. Now, So what is really powering this transformation and changes that's, that's happening today? So, and I'm trying to move my slide here, just a minute. Uh, okay. I think if you think about the first industrial revolution, it was the steam technologies which powered that revolution at that point of time. But really, steam was just an enabler. I think what's important is that is what people did with the technology, what people did with steam power, for example. So the ones which you re really so sort of refer to is how it changed from cottage industries to mechanized industries. But there are other verticals too. For example, in transportation, land transportation, it moves from carriage to um, steam powered trains, for example, and how the, the transportation on, on, on water changed from, again, from wind powered sail ships to steam powered ships right so it's not just about the industry it's across the board so what is really powering this fourth industrial revolution i think analyst talks about this digital platform it's not just about and i think when you talk about digital it's not just about computerization i think that's part of it but i think it's bigger than that so let's try to understand a bit what what do we mean by digital platforms so i i'll use this so it is kind of a combination of several technologies, right? So for example, if you look at, um, you know, what's being used today, people talk about social and how we use Facebook, Google, and, you know, WhatsApp extensively, right, on our mobile. And that there's huge amounts of data that all these companies, digital companies need to use different kinds and ways of processing uh, huge terabytes of data in a short period of time. And they wouldn't have been, if you think about all these companies coming from nowhere, they wouldn't have been able to afford buying a lot of computer hardware, right? So the hyperscale cloud computing, which brought the cost of computing down by an order of magnitude, 
help them to be successful in their business. And now with Internet of Things, where the sensors, the actuators are connected via the internet to this underlying platform, and that creates huge, even more data that enables us to then embark on advanced automation using artificial intelligence. But if you look at most of the successful companies, they, they, they don't look at just IoT or just social or just big data. They use this whole combination as a platform for them. And then you think about Grab, for example, right? It's a combination. It's a combination of mobile and big data and cloud and artificial intelligence. They leverage all this as a platform. And that's what we call as being digital. So sometimes I get stressed out and say, oh, you know, I'm IoT and therefore I'm digital. No, <laughs> that's just part of the story. It has to be that whole platform. Now, before I leave this slide, there's two other things I'd like to comment. I think a lot of people th say that, oh, this technology is moving so fast, right? I, I have a slightly different view. I think the use of technology is moving, changing very fast, right? Uh, we didn't use smartphones 15 years ago. We use smartphone now. But if you look at the underlying technologies for each of this, right, they've been around for a long time. Think about artificial intelligence. I mean, for those of you in computer science, I'm sure you know that, uh, you know, Alan Turing talked about uh, the Turing test in 1950s, right? And even if, let's say, the next generation of disruptions happen through quantum computing, quantum computing was things that the underlying technologies like entanglement and superposition that was taught by Einstein in the early 1900s, right? So a lot of the fundamental technologies here have not changed. It's just the use of technology. And what's driving this is not really technology, but eco the economics of using the technology or the democratization of technology. That means you think about it, when you have your use your phone today, it is three times more powerful than the computer that brought Apollo 11 to the moon. And in today's world, you know, you can just buy it for less than a thousand ringgit, whilst that computer which bought April 11 to the moon cost billions at that point of time, right? So you can actually afford it. And what what's more important is you can use it because of the graphical user interface and so on. So that's about democratization of technology. The third piece that I would like to highlight is that all these technologies are internet enabled. The moment you pull the internet, it becomes less effective. So think about this, right? You, you use... Turn on your, your iPhone or your Android phones, turn off the LTE, turn off the Wi-Fi, what does it become? Yeah, it becomes a dumb phone, a Nokia 3270, and I get the younger ones to know what it is, right? So the, the, the final thing that I'd like to touch is also that because it's internet enabled, that is why cybersecurity is becoming a very important uh, topic these days, yeah? But that's another big story. Now, let's look at what is the impact, you know, of transformation? What kinds of transformation is enabled by digital? I think I like to use the words uh, used by Google. There are two main things which is happening. One is that cus consumer, customer, citizen has more power today, right? We have now power to change governments, for example, right? Even in Malaysia, right? Uh, but not only that, you think about students today in selecting universities, they have a lot of information. When you buy your next car or your next handbag, you have a lot of information before you actually decide to buy. So there's a lot of power which is moving to the social side of things. But the same technology, digital technologies are also enabling organizations, digital companies to be more agile. And that's a key part. When they're agile, then they can then respond to the needs of the market and the customers a lot more faster than what it used to be, all right? And without this digital technology, organizations cannot actually respond to the needs of the market in a way that is required today. And this is why Klaus Schwab, the founder and CEO of the World Economic Forum, talks about in this new world, it's not about a big fish eating the small fish, but it's about a fast fish eating the slow fish, right? And you saw that, right? How Grab and Uber, right? Totally disrupted the decade-old transportation industry. And I can go on and on to give all these examples. He also highlights the fact that while there's a lot of opportunities generated, whether it's big or small companies, it is also a 
problem and a challenge for those companies who do not want to change the way they do business or don't want, want to change we operate right and i think this is a, a fair comment if you think about self even in education for example there's going to be a lot of disruption and changes especially after covid 19. just to show this point this is an interesting uh, chart of blackberry right and i think some of you have seen this chart where it was a very successful company when Apple became digital and launched its iPhone in 2007. For the next three years, they were still quite successful, but suddenly in 2010, over a period of just five months, it kind of totally became irrelevant, right? And, and what they did not do is to digitally transform so that they can constantly create this next S curve for them, right? Um, and, and this is what companies today, if you have a business or you're running an organization, this is something you need to do. You need to create the next asset. What is next that we need to do? So in today's world, businesses need to have kind of dual personality, right? If you have a business, a mature business, then yes, you use the traditional ways of maximizing your returns, efficiency, productivity, and so on to drive your, your matured business. While that's necessary, it's insufficient because companies today need to have kind of a startup mentality where innovation, taking risks, right? Calculated risks and be able to be agile, to change according to the needs of the market. And that's very important to survive in the longer term, right? Now, I had a opportunity to have a fireside chat with the, uh, the the CEO of Grab. And he talks about how if this digital technologies, the use of the mobile, the social, the underlying big data, which needs to be processed terabytes of data every hour, the cheap computing power provided by the hyperscale cloud, AI, and so on, really that Grab business cannot exist, okay? So, uh, you know, it was just fortunate that, you know, that this kind of stack of technology, the digital technology became available to them to drive the business that they are in. But also note that if you look at the, when I look at the interface in April 2019, I see, of course, they are successful in the car hailing business, but they started to introduce things like food, right? They're moving in the food industry, they're moving to delivery, they're moving into fintech for prepaid. And then if you look at their interface in September 2019, they added three additional services, right? Including hospitality being one of them. And if you, if you open up Grab app today, and I'm sure all of you have Grab, Grab app, right? Uh, you'll find that there's already 10 different services and the additional three there, right? Including, I think the new one is gift cards or clean and fix, right? So they're moving to all sorts of industries. And you see that innovation side, the, the left-hand side of that cycle just now, that is the kind of things that companies these days need to do. So now let's switch about COVID, uh, about, you know, uh, what's happening in COVID. No, so I think, uh, I, I'm sure all of you in the WhatsApp group and any WhatsApp group have seen this, right? So who led the digital transformation in organization? And of course, the answer is uh, COVID-19, right? Uh, very interesting. But to me, if I talk about COVID-19, what it has done is it has forced us through this, you know, if you're a Star Trek buff like me, and I'm sure some of you are, I know someone who is, uh, you know, it has pulled us through this wormhole. Suddenly you're from, you know, our side of the galaxy, which is called the Alpha Quadrant. Suddenly you appear in the other side of the galaxy, which is called the Delta Quadrant, right? And you, you do know what's going to happen in that Delta Quadrant because things are going to be totally different. And I kind of think that this is the feeling I get coming through this COVID-19 scenario. And from Microsoft's perspective, you see that, you know, what we plan or what we expected to happen in two years, uh, this transformation has happened in two months, right? That's what we see uh, globally around the world. And I think locally, we have seen how even, you know, our PM talks about, hey, we need to have a new work culture. We need to leverage on digital platforms, you know, that, you know, that combination of technologies. And, and he was also talking about how, you know, e-government is really not working as it is because it's not quite digital and how, you know, he wished that education has gone digital four years ago, right? 
So really what's happening is that we are really now in this new normal. It's not like when I talk about this, not two years down the road, it's actually now. We have to deal with this new normal today. And there are challenges, obviously, right? We see that around the world, we have a lot of you know, unemployment happening. Some digital business is also struggling. For example, scooter, uh, this, uh, scooter sharing or car sharing uh, businesses, that's going to be struggling if they don't expand according just like grab right so grab was lucky they had the food business and that became more you know in this COVID 19 scenario scenario that became the main main um you know revenue generator for them right education is impacted i remember when the first time uh in the early parts of uh COVID 19 the lockdown was higher education was not allowed to operate at all while well, the schools were allowed to operate online right so it's kind of surprising and the effects on stock market, the crash of stock market, even Malaysia itself, follow the same kind of trends. And I think that has affected many of us. But it also generates opportunities, right? It, uh, for example, I talked about just now how in the area where the hyperscale cloud providers are seeing huge amounts and demands, and we are helping businesses. Uh, we're giving, for example, free Skype services for six months so that Companies can continue to operate over these COVID-19 lockdowns, for example, right? We see that there's less pollution. We see that there is new businesses flourishing like business, uh, food delivery and, uh, you know, and, and, and product delivery. We see online shopping is actually blooming, for example. So, yes, there's a disadvantage, but there's also advantages. Now... Are things going to go backwards after COVID-19? I do not think so. I think a lot of countries are looking at how they can leverage and benefit, you know, coming out. The exit, they have a proper exit strategy so that they can not only recover, but also succeed. And this is kind of a tool that allows them to figure out, okay, what should they prioritize, right? So what happens is that on the x-axis, you see it is the infection risk. So on the on the left side is a high infection, right side is low infection risk. And then from the top and bottom, high GDP contribution, low GDP contribution. And you can chart this in many ways. For example, you can chart this in terms of employment and many other things. But let's just focus on uh, GDP contribution itself. Now, if I look at this, if I were to prioritize, obviously the top right-hand corner, right? You can't do everything in one go. And if you look at the top right-hand corner itself, right, things like high tech, right? Industry 4.0 and manufacturing 4.0, financial services, right? Uh, remote delivery, even face-to-face -face customer. Most of them today are actually digitized. They're they are driven by digital technologies. Even face-to-face -face customer business, if you look at it today, when you try to, you know, they try to push you towards more of a digital interface, whether it's a chatbot or WhatsApp or whatever it is, and then, and then you get this face-to-face -face opportunity, right? So that's kind of the way business is being done today. So this is where the priorities, a lot of countries are looking at where, where these priorities are. And a lot of this requires high, you know, intensity in terms of from a tech, technology perspective. But to go digital, it's not only about technology. I think that's the easiest part, especially when you're leveraging on democratized technology. I think the challenge we have is on the people side of things because that requires a mindset change and that is where the challenge is. In 2018, we did a kind of a study on how prepared are we from being digital, right? And we did it across Asia Pacific. We, we, we surveyed 15 countries across different kinds of verticals, agriculture, automotive, education, financial institutions and organizations of different sizes, big ones, small ones, and, and so on. And we measured, and, and we did this with, uh, we commissioned IDC to do this, and they had a, a, a methodology where they look at six dimensions from, infra, from a technology standpoint is infrastructure, the data, the strategy, and people standpoint in terms of investments, culture, as well as capabilities. And then obviously when they chart the average for the whole Asia Pacific, they will get something in the middle, right? So guess where Malaysia is? Unfortunately, we are a bit be a lot behind. And the two major areas that we are behind is data. We do not have a data culture. Think about yourselves when your hard disk is full. What do you do with the hard disk? You probably go and wipe it out, right? The hard disk is more expensive than the data in it, right? 
but the second point is investment. But when I talk investment, I think we do we do invest a lot in computerization. If you look at the amount of money we spend in computerization, it's high. But we are spending on the wrong things. We are not spending on digital. We are not spending on that digital platform, the democratized technology. We're doing still doing things the old ways, the hard way, the most expensive way, right? So I think that's where the problem is. And it's a mindset change, really, right? And, and also what we did was we said, like, what is the thing we're stopping organizations, right, from uh, transforming? And the main feedback was, you know, the lack of thought leadership by the leadership, especially investments in AI and digital technologies and so on, right? Uh, the other two are lack of skills and resources, but it's a colliery of, again, lack of leadership uh, to drive the organization in that direction. So I think for Malaysia itself, as we go through this COVID-19, it gives us that opportunity to really move ourselves to be, you know, to transform ourselves digitally. Organizers need to transform themselves digitally and urgently. To, to, be, to remain relevant and succeed in this new world. Now, let me then talk a bit about skills, right? You have seen that the governments uh, around the world are seeing that they are starting to prioritize digital skills. And for obvious reasons, because that's the bit which is missing. You no, know, just using tech, buying technology is easy, but getting people to fully leverage on it is becoming a mission critical uh, issue as countries face this new normal from this uh, 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 COVID-19. Now, even before that, people like the World Economic Forum has talked about job disruptions and they kind of bucket this into three, three different buckets, right? Redundant roles, stable roles, and new roles. And if you look at the, these run, redundant roles, in, very interesting, you see that even, you know, um, Financial analyst, right? So my son did, uh, you know, actual science and he's now a an financial analyst. I say, guys, you better change your job now, right? Mm -hmm. Learn about AI and, you know, try to do something else, right? Uh, lawyers, for example, right? Uh, good thing engineering, computer science are more of the stable role side right, of things. And obviously, there's, there's a lot of new roles. Now, the good news is that the World Economic Forum predicts that for 75 million jobs is going to disappear. It's going to create another 123 million new jobs. So there's going to be more new jobs than jobs lost. But what is the challenge here is that we need to then learn and transform ourselves into these new kinds of roles. But for those of you in the stable roles, those of us in the stable roles, we cannot sit on our laurels because this role is also transformed. So if you look at this chart, which is prepared by Accenture, it says that on the average, only 11% of our roles today will not change, right? 38% is totally automatable by digital technologies. And 51% of the proportion of these roles will is uh, people need to leverage on technology to augment themselves, become more productive. And it is this for this reason, NYU uh, Stern Business School talks about that what digital technology does, it puts a premium on human skills, which are really uniquely human. For example, empathy, creativity, critical thinking, right? It puts a premium on this. It's really neat. So if you are in a job that you're doing the same thing every day, be careful because that may disappear. If you're giving the same lectures every, every year, be careful that can be easily wiped out, right, by, by your bosses, right? And that is why all of us, all of us, you know, has been recommended by the World Economic Forum to have one, 101 extra days of learning from 2018 to 2022. So I hope you started, right? Now, I just want to close off changing a bit into kind of education since I think, you know, UTM is an education institutions. One thing that OEC says, why skills matter? What are the skills that actually matter most? I think fundamentally it is literacy and numeracy. I think literacy we are okay, although we, we, we probably as, as a nation uh, are struggling in English, for example. But numeracy is very important as a foundational uh, knowledge. 
And that enables things like skills, like technology-rich problem solving. So it's not only using technology, but also using technology to solve problems, right? So these are the kind of skills that is high priority um, uh, from OECD's point of view. Another interesting, uh, probably relevant, uh, you know, point they raise is that qualifications don't always equal to skills. So even in the United States, people with degrees and college degrees does not necessarily have the skills, right? This is something that I think we have to think about. Do really our graduates have this, this combination of skills, which is relevant in today's world? I think that's very important, yeah? And, and the third point says that as time goes on, the, this combination of skills become more and more important for you to get better jobs or to get a job at all, right? And the, the ones which are requiring less of the skills become less and less relevant with time. So I think in today's world, for us as professionals and with a job today, we need to make learning as our own, uh, as a driving factor because learning uh, is the, everyone's business in today's world. Now, before I end, just some thoughts in the area of education as uh, was read out just now, I was involved in the Jawatan Kuasa Kajian Dasar Pendidikan in 2018 to 2019, spent six months on it, and kind of something which aligns well with the OECD says that a lot of the skills that, for example, literacy, numeracy, and these 21st century skills, if you wait until your, your university to do it, I think it's too late. The best time to do it is in early education, right? Especially even in preschool. This is where the focus should be, all right? And in the 21st century skills, particularly, I think, areas that we today as Malaysians, we are struggling is critical thinking and creativity, problem solving, and most important, the love for learning. Because in the new world, we need to just learn and learn and learn all the time. Now, in higher education, it's a bit more interesting to me, right? Because I don't know whether you had, I, I, I used to be a lecturer when I was, you know, I was working in Australia. And we used, in, among academicians, we had this debate. Do we go applied or do we go theoretical, right? Uh, I think at that time, it didn't matter because anything changed will take you 10, 20 years, right? Now... I like to use this uh, kind of framework, which was it, which is uh, developed by ACM, IEEE Computer Society, and the Association of Information Systems, where they plot uh, on the x-axis, you know, body of knowledge which is more theoretical versus body of knowledge which is more applied on the right side, and then on the, the vertical axis is kind of the stacks of body of knowledge for a particular domain, right? Now. The way I see in this new world, as I explained just now, fundamentals have not changed, right? So if you think about it, you know, we need to really then strengthen the fundamentals. But we also need to understand on the applied side, things are fast, things are, are fast changing, right? So I, I think what especially in degree programs, you really need to strengthen your fundamentals. But then when you give them assignments or projects, or maybe there's an elective which is more applied in nature, use the latest technologies. Do not use the same technology that we used 30 years ago. Then they'll come and say, hey, no one's using this, right? Because I know that some, like, some of the academies feel that, oh, if I use new technology, it will hide the fundamentals. It's not really the case. I think people who have tried to do this found that actually when the students are interested in how it's being applied, they become very interested to understand the, the, uh, the, 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 the fundamentals. So when they know, for example, oh, yeah, this is how I evaluate, uh, let's say, an AI model using, you know, using a uh, root mean square error, then they say, oh, what's a root mean square error? And then they will then take the initiative to understand what is R, you know, RMSC, for example, from a mathematical and statistical standpoint, right? So, so I think we have to have that balance. I think... In degree programs, we really need to strengthen the fundamentals. I wouldn't recommend coming up with purely applied because when you go into applied, things will change very fast. So I won't go into details. Uh, you know, we had a lot of discussion giving uh, computing as one of the you know examples we had. Uh, but one of the areas, especially which I, I find 
problematic, not problematic, challenging in computing is that uh, IT is very much, if you look at the body of knowledge, it's very much being applied. And this is where it's very challenging. And I think it's very important to make sure that the kind of things that you expose to students are based on, you know, people don't, for example, people don't configure routers anymore. I think uh, a lot of people, especially on the back end side, because people are using cloud computing, for example, right? So I don't see a lot of universities exposing students to cloud, you know, building whole data centers, uh, virtual data centers in the cloud, for example, right? So just, just a thought. So in conclusion, I think, you know, this diagram is, I, I like to use this diagram because, you know, it, it shows the changes from over 20 years in a New York, in New York, right? On the left side, you see horses. On the right side, you see mechanized transportation. And that happened over 20 years. Now, with COVID-19, this happened in two months, right? Uh, that, so we will need to transform uh, with an added sense of urgency. In the past, it says we have a sense of urgency, but I think with COVID-19, that we are now go, gone through this wormhole and it's a new normal, this is added sense of urgency. The second point is that, you know, this new normal will benefit organizations that are ready digitally. They are digital organizations. They are really transformed. But not only that, it has a learning culture that everyone in the organization is willing and always willing to learn new things as to support the changes that the, the uh, organizations will have to face. And finally, I think for us ourselves, we really need to adopt this lifelong learning uh, culture, right? If you've not done a certification program in the last one year, you should. I think there should be a KPI saying that every year, every one of us should be doing at least one certification uh, program, for example. And that's also the way you then understand how what good online program look like so that you can design your courses and you, the way you teach others in the same way. So with that, thank you very much. And I hope, uh, you know, that will benefit all of us. Uh, I certainly am open to, I mean, it's uh, no hard and fast rules. We are going into the unknown. So, you know, any feedback questions is very much appreciated. You don't have to agree with everything what I say. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And I'll take questions now, I guess, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Zaha, for your good, inspiring, thoughtful, and very thank awesome you, <laughs> sharing and slides with us. Okay, thank you for sharing with us today. Okay, despite of your busy schedule, you are giving your precious time with us today. We believe that it would benefit to our students, staff, alumni, and also our community as well. And yes, we are now adapting our new norm against this pandemic war. And yeah, for those moms, those parents that are juggling with new norm for their children, and online classes and whatsoever. And also now we are start um, go to the office, back to the office. And of course, to our viewers, stay safe. Please keep your social distancing. Uh, and welcome back to the office. But now, um, remember, we have a new norm. And please, please stay safe and make sure everybody sanitize um, your hands and everything. OK. Um, we are having a few questions from our viewers. Okay. All right. Shortly. All right. Ah, um, this is a very interesting yeah. question. Since okay, I'm not, will... you know, I'm not in <laughs> Ministry of Education or in university, I guess I can say my mind. All right. All right. Uh, you okay. don't have to. Uh, you don't have to. Um, to, uh, okay. to accept it. Yeah. So I think the question was for those who don't see, Salam Alaikum, Doctor. What is the advice to academicians who are still in their comfort zone by having conventional methods in teaching and learning, especially during this pandemic? I think I think it's beyond the pandemic. If I think about education today, I was talking to the, the team just now, right? Um, uh, my, my experience. So I, I'll talk about my experience, right? Um, I've never done any certification program for probably since I finished my education for maybe about 30 years. Now, when the realization of, wow, there's so many new technologies coming in, and if I don't keep myself abreast, I'll be out of a job, <laughs> especially in companies like Microsoft. Uh, I started to spend a bit of time you know, learning about data science. You can see I talk about you know, certificate data science, 
professional certifications in big data and also artificial intelligence. I took time to do that. To, so really, we had to open up all the old books and things like that, right? And the thing is, what I realized, uh, uh, and, and looking from a student standpoint, right? If I were to think about attending lectures the way I did 30 years ago, and that's what I mean by this having conventional methods of teaching, right? Uh, I, I think if I were a student today and I have access to this kind of contents, I think I will learn more, right? Think about when you were a student back then, listening to a lecturer, you know, uh, for an hour, typically, right? How many percent of what they say actually you understood? All right? All right? I think the boys would probably be about 20% because they slept most of the time, right? The girls may be 60%. That's why girls get better results. Look that. So, <laughs> but sometimes you are distracted also. <laughs> because you're looking, looking at the guy lecturer, right? Anyway, <laughs> coming, coming back to that, you know, uh, if you were to be an online, it's a, it's a good lecturer. And the way they break it up is in five minutes strength. Then they have kind of questions after that to see whether you understood. You know, if I were to miss any point, I could just rewind. You couldn't do that in a physical lecture, le lecture, right? You cannot rewind the le le lecture. The one, I know you can ask a question and say shut up, right? And then you, after the lecture, you try to find them, they, they're gone, right? In a golf course or whatever it is, right? Traditional like the traditional lecture, okay? So um, I think um, I think in today's world, uh, not only the students are ready for this. I think the students are always ready for this. I think the lectures should change their mindsets here because if it's not for themselves, it's for the students. Because the the reason why we are, if I were to lecture, is because I want to impart knowledge to students, and you want to impart it in the best possible way, right? And I think that is the best possible way, and that is the most natural environments. Or students today, right? They don't, they don't, they see the screen more than they see people, right? So that's the first point. It is our responsibility to change. And that would be the first point. But second point is this, uh, maybe not in the government sector, but if you're in the private sector and you are no longer a relevant teaching staff, uh, you probably be out of a job, right? Uh, just like Microsoft, if, if I'm no, no longer relevant, I'll be out of a job. So I, I would recommend you know, have this change in mindset, you know, it's exciting times really, you know, take that leap of faith that it's okay to do it, you fail. I failed many times in doing all these exams and whatever it is and learn from it. I think that's a key thing. It's part of our lifelong learning. That would be my recommendation. Make sense? Fair? <laughs> Fair. Yep. yep. All right, the next question okay. is from Marami. Do you think... Do you Okay, do you think business acumen also is one important skill that all students must be mastered to save a place in the future? I think there are several uh, layers to this, right? Uh, I think everyone must have a business sense in the sense that when I'm working in anything, whether I'm a coffee maker or a sweeper, I must make sure that my role is relevant to the business and how I map my role to the business is important. Eh? If that's what you mean by business sense, yes. But must I know, for example, you know, accounting, right? Or these other specific skills so that, you know, you are relevant to the business? I think it depends. If you want to become an accountant, it makes sense. If you want to become a business owner, maybe uh, you know business administration uh, is important. And the thing is, not everyone has that passion of doing business at the end of the day, right? So I think we have to, at the end of the day, because we are in an environment where we have to, to, to be relevant in a shortest period of time, we have to focus on you know, what we like to do best. Right, so that we can develop ourselves, and we have different kinds of roles in any business. But, but in general, again, you have to step back and say, "Hey, how how do I contribute to that business?" That business sense is very important. But it, it's not about knowledge; it's about the attitude of learning. Right? What what should I learn so that I can understand the business better, so that I can perform this in this business and contribute in the best possible way? Um, 
but then do you need us everyone to do economics everyone to do accounting i would hesitate to recommend that at this point of time that's my opinion okay thank you doctor all right um do we have another questions from viewers hold, hold on all right right i think it's very similar to what i say i think not everyone wants once or can become an entrepreneur because entrepreneur has got a certain skill and character okay. they're risk-taking they are you know they, 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 they're passionate about business and so on so for me i'm definitely not an entrepreneur right in fact uh, I, I was running a business at one time and i know that if you run a business actually you get more money you know makan gaji is not the best place for you to make money in reality right uh but but the thing is you know you can't force everyone to be entrepreneurs because that, that requires certain passion and certain skills right now when it comes to fourth industrial revolution you know this group of people who are entrepreneurs um are the ones that are typically creating these disruptions right are the ones but the thing is what's important for this entrepreneur and this is where I, i'm not very sure on where you know in terms of uh, the education system in learning about the new ways for example one of the things that is i'm not sure whether you this is if you, you're interested about this look at this book it's called a uh, platform revolution right it gives you a very interesting way of modeling this disruptive business models right it, it leverages on how you ensure that the you know the participants in the ecosystems actually benefits you, you enable them to benefit and create value among themselves that's a focus you're not about me selling you that's linear business right i'm not sure how much of that kind of thinking the network effects of this double-sided markets for example is being exposed to the modern entrepreneurs because what i worry is that the kind of entrepreneur thinking is a very traditional entrepreneur thinking and if you do that then what happens you are at the the lower end of the value chain right we need mm -hmm. to look at entrepreneurs who understand how to leverage on platform economics to be able to then catapult themselves to create their own platforms. So I think that is, it is important. Entrepreneurs are important. Not everyone can do it, but even the entrepreneurs today, I hope they are learning new kinds of entrepreneurship based on, uh, you know, platform economy and not based on the old way of doing things. I hope I kind of answered your question. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Um, yeah, that's good idea about the new platform in entrepreneurial um, kind of in future, All right? Okay, do you have any for the question? Oh, yeah, all right. Okay, if that's so, I will pass back to your Bahagia, Dr. Rafiq, okay. and also thank you again, Dr. Zaha. Thank uh, you so much for your well, time with us, for your good sharing with us. Hopefully, to see you again in future, inshallah. Whether so, uh, online, webinar, or also we have uh, um, meeting face to face in future, Dr. All right, so, I will uh, pass okay, back too. to your Bahagia, Dr. Rafiq, for last few words for today and okay. to all uh, and all to the viewers. Uh, inshallah, I will close it. Let, uh, soon. All right. Thank you very much, yeah. Bye-bye. Uh, Murni, thank you, Murni. Dr. Zaha, thank you. Thank you so very much for, for spending some of your precious time with us. Thank you uh, you so know, much. I really enjoy all your slides, uh, but you know what? There, there was one slide that really stands out from the rest, and it was <laughs> one where you show the Star Trek that's right. Coming, <laughs> I know. <laughs> coming out from walk. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, you said I'm also a Star Trek fan. Uh, and yeah. you talk about, you know, Star Trek going from Alpha Quadrant to Delta Quadrant. You know, sometimes <laughs> I think of my position as the Dean is just like the captain of the Enterprise. And yeah. I'm the yeah. Captain wow. James Tiberian Kirk, you know, to bowl <laughs> and no one has gone before that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I really wish that I can uh, travel through a wormhole. But, but uh, then again, uh, you know, Star Trek uh, developed 
Uh, when you, you know you you have one slide where you talk about uh, uh, theoretical or applied applied yes so, so so in star trek there is this warp drive you know warp drive <laughs> one warp two warp three you know so so it is still theoretical you know people are still uh, doing research on this warp drive you know super fast uh, uh, spacecraft you know that that can go beyond the speed of light so, so yes, I agree with you. Uh, theoretical applied, you know. So everything uh, is uh, packaged in Star Trek. That's why I'm a Star Trek friend, uh, uh, fan, just like you. So again, uh, Doctor Zaha, thank you so very much. Uh, we can talk about Star Trek afterwards, you know. Of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but of course, you know. Hopefully, we can uh, continue our collaboration uh, yes. between DTM and Microsoft. Uh, again, uh, thank you, Dr. Zaha. A very interesting uh, uh, topic we uh, we had this uh, morning with Dr. Zaha, the National Technology Officer of uh, Microsoft. And to all of you, our viewers, uh, thank you also uh, to all of you. I would like to ask uh, all of you joining our session right now to like, comment, and share. Let me get this one right. Hey, I managed to get this one right. You know, this is the first time. And we had our webinars for the past uh, uh, two weeks or so. Yeah, this is the first time I got it right. You know, so I'm pointing. I'm pointing at the right uh, uh, image. Like, comment, and share our Faculty of Engineering, UTM Johor Bahru. Yes, and then um, of course we have uh, many more uh, uh, Captain of Industries uh, that we invite from uh, various industries. Do come and join us uh, in our next uh, webinar series. Thank you, Dr. Zaha, and thank you to all of you. Uh, back to you, Murni. Thank you so. Thank you so much, Dato. Yes, we are gradually improvise ourselves. Okay, thank you for our viewers today. It is always a pleasure for us for having our large number of viewers for our webinar, Captain of Industry today. Please wait to our upcoming webinar with our next Captain of Industry and surely with interesting issue. Please don't forget to like, comment and share our program. To all of our viewers, stay safe. Please keep your social distancing because I know that you are coming just back to the office. Starts yesterday and also uh, until june july and in future all right please don't again have a good day wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and bye see you next time